please help yourselves. So the data will be coming shortly. My name is Jim Elser. I'm the director of the bio station. If I haven't met you yet, I say that because I know we have a bunch of students who arrived for classes last week, and I haven't had a chance to say hello. So welcome to all the new students, and I hope your classes are going really well. Those of you who are doing credit, taking the seminar for credit, um, I think I'm, I'm still missing a paper or two for last week, so please give me that uh, before you leave today. Um, regarding those taking the seminar for credit for today's summary, could you get me to that by Friday, 5 p.m., because many of you will be leaving. Uh, and so you might want to get that done before you leave. So Friday, 5 p.m., you can give it to me, find me, find, put it in my mailbox over there, give it to Marie, Holly, or Monica, okay? Um, Mine are also for the students this Thursday night, 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock, sports night at the director's house. So come on over, play some badminton or whatever, and relax, have some ice cream while you're taking a break from your projects. I don't know if you have projects to do on Friday, but you know, it's good to feel the exercise and relaxation to make your mind work properly. All right, um, I'm seeing a lot of good stuff on um, Instagram and such. Reminder to use our hashtag when you're out there doing fun things with the classes. Um, and then uh, for any folks who are, well, for, in general, I want to announce all the public events that are coming up for the bio station. So we have our annual research cruise, which is Wednesday uh, at 3.30 out of Lakeside. That's a fundraiser for the bio station. We have our August Science on Tap coming up on August 1st at the Glacier Brewing Company in Polson. And then um, the ever popular open house for the bio station on Wednesday, the 2nd of August for one to five. Okay, so spread the word. Everyone's welcome. And, <coughs> and if you can't get enough bio station uh, in your life, those are three chances to get even more. <laughs> uh, in any case. All right, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our final Dana Donuts speaker, Dr. Anna Sala. Dr. Sala is a professor of organismal biology, ecology, and evolution at the University of Montana, where she has been uh, on the faculty since 1995. Um, she has a bachelor's degree from the University, University of Barcelona and a PhD also from the University of Barcelona. She did a postdoctoral uh, time at the University of Nevada. Dr. Sala, as you see, is a plant physiolo physiological ecologist who works in the western forests and is especially interested in how plants cope with drought and how drought stress affects many dimensions of forest ecology, including insect outbreaks and fire dynamics. She recently authored a very exciting paper in the prestigious journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, showing how natural selection in ponderosa pine shifts before and after these outbreaks. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sala to the fire station. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, everybody, for coming. I want to be a student so bad that I'm <laughs> going to be taking a couple of classes here. This is wonderful. Maybe teach you. Um, so in the old times, people had root cellars, and they stored potatoes and other uh, root crops. And why did they store these uh, potatoes for food and energy during the, <coughs> the winter? And Die. No. Ah, it's not. <laughs> and so that's the the same reason actually why the potatoes themselves store starch. So if you don't want to eat starchy food, don't eat potatoes. And and this is because they are underground organs and when we plant them, they still don't have leaves to photosynthesize and they need reserves to get a good head start. Okay? So today, actually, what I want to do is um, convince you that <clears throat> these stored reserves actually might perform another very important function that has been overlooked so uh, far. So plants, um, about 45% of the dry mass of plants is just carbon, okay? And this carbon is mainly in celluloses and lignins in cell walls that surround living plant cells that are full of water and allow that water to exert the positive pressure on living cells. It's also in that cells that are specialized in conducting water, the xylem, which makes up most of the wood. So 45% is carbon, another 40% is hydrogen and oxygen, okay? So a lot of carbon 
And so how do they get the carbon? They get the carbon via uh, photosynthesis in leaves. CO2 comes in through the, uh, the stomata, and that's coupled with water loss. So there's a risk in assimilating carbon because plants are also losing water. Then they perform photosynthesis. They make carbohydrates from photosynthesis, and these carbohydrates then are distributed into growth, so building new tissues, new cell walls, new xylem, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, for energy, respiration. Mm -hmm. Any living cell expires and needs energy. They export some to the soil for microbes, to feed microbes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but then they also put part of it to storage in the form of non-structural carbohydrates, which I will be referring as MSC. Now, potatoes are a specialized storage organ that has a lot of starch. However, storage can occur in any living plant cells, in leaves, and stems, in roots, and uh, in the form of starch granules that are stayed here in, the, in this picture. And so, in plant physiology, we've always interpreted this store as a reservoir, as a pantry, okay? For, to buffer periods during stress when the carbon input via photosynthesis is not enough to um, meet the demands for growth, for respiration, and for other demands. So it's, a, it's always been seen as a reservoir, okay? And so <clears throat> if we do, how much of these storage do plants have in general? And here we have NSC, so that's the storage in different uh, biomes, boreal, temperate, Mediterranean, and tropical, and then in leaves, stems, and roots. And this is based on a review that we did, 996 species. And we see that they vary from anywhere from 8 to 14 percent of the dry biomass is these um, um, starches and, and storage compounds that are not in cell walls, that are not, they are not part of structural uh, components. And so this is actually a lot. So plants have abundant uh, stored MSC. And it doesn't, might not seem enough to you, 8 to 14%, that's not that much, but that's the entire biomass. So imagine this ponderosa pine. Suppose that it has, uh, the above ground biomass weighs 100, uh, 1,000 kilograms. If we say 8%, the lower uh, margin, that's 80 kilograms of non-structural carbohydrates. That's 80 kilograms of starch and, and, and sugar compounds that are not in cell walls. That's a lot, 80 kilograms, okay? And it's a lot because to make the above ground biomass, these 80 kilograms could make almost four times above ground net primary productivity. So that means a tree could be not photosynthesizing for four years and use the store reserves to do that, okay? So that's really a lot. The, uh, 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 these pools are very high. And the surprising thing is that these pools are not depleted as, as we uh, expected. If we think that plants are storing these just as a reserve, just as a buffer, when we experimentally or naturally plants are subjected to stresses that reduce photosynthesis, that reduce the input of this uh, uh, carbon, we expect plants to be using those reserves, right? Like potatoes, when they sprout, they, they do deplete the starch. Well, and that's not, often is not the case. And this is an example here um, where this is a starch concentration, and this is in oaks that wear controls, and then either half defoliated or fully defoliated. <coughs> and this is the above ground and the below ground. And what you see clearly is not only the, the the starch is depleted, but it actually increases. So, so you know, that would be like a potato is sprouting and it's actually increasing the starch. It doesn't make any sense. And uh, the same, oops, what? Bear with me. The same uh, when we subject plants to stress. This is aspen trees uh, subjected under drought. And again, the starch, and we see that the droughted aspens actually increase the starch rather than decrease. And under stress, there's no photosynthesis. We would expect them to use the storage, and rather they are accumulating. So that's puzzling. And so the question emerges, why do plants store so much carbon? 
And there are three main hypotheses. One is that these stored pools become sequestered, and I'll, I'll tell you what uh, I mean by that. The second is that this is actually, they have excess carbon, they have a lot, okay? And the third, which is the one that I wanna elaborate on, is that these pools are there for a reason, okay? So stored pools become sequestered, and this is what I call the garage hypothesis meaning that we just store, dump stuff in the garage. The coffee maker, when we move, goes into the garage. We go to the new apartment. Ah, I need the coffee maker. <laughs> Who knows where it is? I'm going to buy a new one. <laughs> it becomes in, in, in non-accessible, okay? However, um, experiments that have um, analyzed the age of carbon of re-sprouting stumps <coughs> have shown that actually this carbon is very old, up to 15 years old. So this is, they are using, rather than the new carbon assimilated, they are using this very old carbon. So they don't seem to become sequestered. They are accessible and they use it when need be. The other hypothesis is that they are surplus, uh, that they have so much storage because it's excess. They have more than they can do with, okay? that was. Uh, proposed by Christian Corner, a very um, prominent plant ecophysiologist in Europe. And it's based on the idea of the sourcing balance. So uh, the source of carbohydrates is photosynthesis via CO2. And then we have the sinks, which is any activity that will use those carbohydrates, respiration and use for energy, growth to build tissues, export, etc. <coughs> And so if the source is m smaller than the sink, they are not photosynthesizing enough to meet the needs, then the reserves will go down. And that might reflect that carbon is limited, okay? However, if the source is greater than the demands, then we have more carbon coming in than the plant is using, and those reserves will go <coughs> up. Oops. And so that, that is the situation that we find, very abundant reserves. And so that corner came to the conclusion that, hey, you guys, these two plants have their tank all the time full. They don't, they don't need carbon. Well, you can imagine that this is a pretty revolutionary sort of hypothesis because it means plants are not going to respond to high CO2. Right? Because CO2 is fertilization effect, makes more photosynthesis, more carbohydrates, and we expect plants to grow more and to mitigate the effects of elevated CO2 in the atmosphere. Well, he's saying, no, 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 no. They have plenty of CO2. You have more, they're not necessarily going to grow more. Um, but then we see, as I've shown you, that these reserves really are not used, even when we experimentally subject plants to tremendous stresses, tremendous imbalances between the source and the sink. So when we defoliate the plant, we remove completely the source, <coughs> and yet they are not using these carbohydrates. In fact, they are increasing it, okay? So, and the idea, as I show you with that uh, review of 196 species, the idea that Plants in general have surplus carbon, that this is the norm, is completely at odds with the idea that plants optimize carbon assimilation. <coughs> and, um, and we see that in, in, at many, many levels, at the cellular and, and subcellular levels, chloroplasts in the shade distribute themselves to get the light. Um, plants acclimate to different light, sun and shade, to optimize light and perform photosynthesis and optimize photosynthesis. This is from my dissertation a long time ago, and this is the distribution of leaf area over the height of a tree. And we see that most of the leaves are at the top to get the sunlight and to photosynthesize. And so in addition, carbon assimilation is very, very expensive because it takes a lot of proteins to, for the process of photosynthesis, so that means a lot of nitrogen, which is limiting. And also because stomata need to open for plants to get the CO2, so that means they are losing water, it's a huge risk. So why would plants incur this cost of carbon assimilation if they have surplus, and why would they optimize carbon assimilation if they don't need it? and it's expensive, it doesn't make any sense. So the, 
the, the, the century old idea is that plants trade water for carbon, okay? When they open the stomata in the leaves, that means losing water, and they have to do that to get the carbon, the CO2, okay? So they trade water for carbon, the big, big trade-off, okay? And what <coughs> we suggest then is that, oops, I'm not good at this. So <laughs> what we suggest is that actually, these storage that we have thought that just was a reservoir, a, a, a buffer, might actually perform another very critical function, which is, sorry, which is um, a, a, a metabolic function and an osmotic role. So that means that um, the, 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 those carbohydrates might help plants retain and move water, okay? And so if that's the case, we have a situation where, when plants might need carbon actually to retain and move the water, okay? So that's sort of an addition to this very century old idea, the trade-off between water and carbon. So I didn't know what kind of audience I would have here and I have to do a basic of plant water relations before I move uh, uh, on, okay? But we, <coughs> Plant physiologists measure what we call the water potential, okay? Which is an indicator of water status. The more, the, the tricky thing that I would like you guys to pay attention is that it goes from zero maximum to negative, so low, okay? The more negative, the drier is the plant, okay? The other very important concept is that in plants, it's not like animals that we have pumps that circulate our blood and whatnot. In plants, water moves completely passively following gradients of water potential from moist to dry, like the laundry, okay? <clears throat> the other important thing that many of you might know is that plants transport the water from the soil to the leaves through the xylem, and xylem is made of dead cells with very strong cell walls, and <coughs> that the water in the xylem the, is, is liquid, but is under tension. And the reason is because at the leaf level, water evaporates through the atmosphere, it diffuses through the stomata, and it evaporates. And that sucks the water from the soil. And that sucking effect creates tension in these living cells, okay? So there's why under tension. That means low water potential, low water status. Okay? And so, but the other critical thing that I want to emphasize is that the xylem supplies water, these dead cells supply water to any living cells adjacent to this xylem, okay? And any living plant cell, whether it's in the leaves, in the stems, or in the roots, any living plant cells need to be bursting with water to be functional. So that means they need to be under positive turbulence. If not, they desiccate, they die, they don't function, and the plant dies, okay? So we have an interesting situation because here's our xylem where the water is under tension, low water potential, okay? But this xylem needs to be supplying water to these living cells that are bursting with water. Now imagine yourself sucking through um, a straw, water, okay? And you put in the straw little holes and you put uh, little water bottles, and if you saw the water bottles, it's not going to fill at all. So the idea is, how does that occur? How can this thing that the water is under tension can supply water to these cells? Well, the only way is if these living cells actually reduce their water potential to lower that the xylem. Then we're going to have a gradient from high to low, and water can move. Okay, and we'll see how they do that. The other amazing thing, if we consider that all the plant cells are bursting with water, is how in the world do plants retain that water? So this is a plant, soil, water, higher water potential, less negative. And you know, well water soil will have a minus 0 0.5 megapascals for reference, that's a pressure unit, okay? The atmosphere, at 50% relative humidity, and here is a lot lower, 
at 50% relative humidity, 20 degrees, the water potential of the air is minus 95.2. That's orders of magnitude lower than that in the soil. So what that means is that plants are constantly facing risk of desiccation, okay? And, <clears throat> and because it's so low, that's what makes the water diffuse and evaporate through the leaves, and that's what generates the xylem tension, okay? So how in the world do you plan remain hydrated under these cir circumstances? I mean, I, I used to live in Las Vegas, Nevada, I used to put um, jeans in the middle of the summer, 15 minutes they were bone dry. Now, a plant is full of water, and they do live in the desert. Yeah? How do they do that? Okay? So, well, one way is they cover their tissues with <coughs> impermeable cuticles to prevent water loss, but of course, then they need to have stomata, the openings that open and close, because they will need to get CO2 but they can regulate it when they're gonna do that, so stomata and cuticles are very important, but the other thing is cell turner maintenance, okay? Mechanisms that allow these cells to be full of water despite being in contact with the, the xylem, so this is, this is a microscope, a slice up of a stem, this is the xylem, the dead cells, and then next to it are the living cells, okay? And so, <coughs> How do they, how can cells lower their water potential relative to the xylem if they are full of water? Does anyone know here? Sorry. <laughs> I always do this. <laughs> <laughs> so with cells, they actually reduce their water potential. So then, so if you eat a lot of ham, salty ham, you're gonna become very thirsty. So you're drying yourself out. <coughs> okay. So solutes reduce the water potential, and the water potential is actually the total water potential, and that's what water moves. Following gradients of total water potential is the sum of two components if we ignore gravity. One is the pressure, and in cells is positive, and that's the one we need to keep positive. But the other is the osmotic, and that's always negative because every time we add solids to a water, it makes that water drier. So salty water is actually drier. It's harder for plants to get water from, from marshes than it is from um, fresh water, okay? So, okay, these cells need to have water potential. If they want to get water from the xylem, their water potential needs to be lower than minus 1.5. <coughs> so what do they do? Well, they do, the water needs to be under pressure, so that's one. But if they accumulate solutes, that lowers the osmotic potential, making the total lower than that of the xylem, and then the water can move in. Okay? So what that means is that the drier the xylem, when drought increases and the tension increases, the adjacent living cells will need to keep accumulating solutes to keep their water potential lower and keep getting water, okay? So what we see, <coughs> oh, what type of solutes? Well, one important type of solutes are inorganic ions, like potassium in plants is very important. The problem with this is their charge, and whenever we have charges inside cells, is that new cells need to be electrically neutral. They are acquired from the soil, so the, the plant needs to bring them up, and they are difficult to store in large amounts. Where do they store? How do they store them? The other type of organic carbon-based solutes, which are soluble sugars and other compounds, <coughs> and those are electrically neutral, which is a lot better. They are synthesized by the plant, so the plant can, can um, <coughs> regulate. And the big thing is that they can be stored in very large amounts in non-osmotically active forms. For instance, the starch is not as good at retaining water as soluble sugars are. So plants can have starch and then when they need water can break it down, make soluble sugars, and then the soluble sugars bring the water in, okay? So this is the idea. If this cell here needs to get water from this cell here, say that this is the xylem, okay, and this is a living cell, 
This living cell will have to have lower water potential than the xylem for water to move. And so what it can do to lower its water potential is break down this starch, make the solute sugars, and that will bring the water. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, and this might be very important because plants during the day uh, exhibit the strong fluctuations of water potential. This is a diurnal at the hour of day, and this is the water potential. It goes from minus 0.25 to minus point, almost minus 0.2. That's an enormous change. So as the xylem tension is increasing, the Jessian plant will have to keep increasing the solute to keep getting the water. And so that starch might become very handy. And this is from my dissertation, a <coughs> seasonal pattern in Mediterranean oaks. This is a typical Mediterranean pattern with the summer drought here, spring and fall rain. The plants are nicely hydrated in the spring, but then the drought comes and, the, and they are very dehydrated. So the xylem is under tension. That's when they might need the, the soluble sugars, okay? Okay, so that means that this storage that we thought it was a reservoir, it was a pantry, might actually have a very important additional role, which is an osmotic and metabolic <coughs> role. So this is for the long term to buffer imbalances, but this is an immediate need. Plants all the time need to retain water. So that might explain the abundant pools because they need them. So, um, so if these MSCs, non-structural carbohydrates, have this important metabolic role, what we expect is that plants can really never deplete too much their pools because then they risk not being able to retain water, okay? And so excessive depletion should, could be lethal. And the other thing is that plants should regulate storage to prevent depletion. So that storage is not simply a passive result of how much comes in, how much comes uh, uh, is used, but if plants actually their tank is getting low, then their met metabolism is gonna change to prioritize the tank over other needs, over growth, for instance, okay? So we had this, we tested this with this review of 196 perenni perennial species in natural environments. We measure the non-structural carbohydrates, the starch, and then soluble sugars, sucrose, fructose, and glucose. We measure in different functional t types, herbs, conifers, angiosperms, whether evergreen, drought deciduous, or winter deciduous, different biome, boreal, temperate, Mediterranean, tropical, different organs. And then what we really needed was seasonal data. So how seasonally we change, okay? And so bear with me, but the prediction is that we predicted, okay, if we go in nature, we never should see strong depletions of non-structural carbohydrates because we hypothesize they are critical for plants to retain and move water. So what we have here, these are the different functional types, the conifers, evergreen, drought deciduous, winter deciduous, and herbaceous. This is the components, the soluble <coughs> sugars, the starch, and the total, and in different organs, the leaves, the stems, and below ground. And what we represent here is the minimum seasonal relative to the maximum. So how much do they deplete relative to the maximum, okay? And I'm gonna focus on the total. And what we see is that on average, those minimums are about 40%. So they don't go, they don't deplete as the most they use uh, for, uh, they, the minimums are at, at least 40% and sometimes very higher of the maximum. So they really don't use them. They have very high minimums NSCs, okay? And <clears throat> the other thing that we see is that these minimums are actually pretty constant across the species. And this is the only difference here is these uh, um, herbaceous stems, but this is because low sample size. But they are very constant and very high. At the most, they will deplete 40% and they don't <coughs> deplete anymore, okay? The other thing that we see, this is the same uh, arrangement, the soluble sugars, the starch and NSC in different organs, but now I have the average um, non-structural carbohydrates components. And all I wanna say is that 
the leaves is where they store more. That doesn't make sense. We would expect, you know, to be in more perennial organs, yet they are leaves. And the other thing is that herbaceous plants, whether <coughs> it's soluble sugars or starch, particularly starch and the total, have very <coughs> high, the highest non-structural carbohydrates. These are herbaceous plants. These plants are growing fast. You wouldn't expect them to store. You would expect store to be the ones that slow grow, that live for a long time, that need this buffer, not in herbaceous. What's common in leaves and herbaceous, they have a very large proportion of living cells relative to woody tissues, relative to non-herbaceous plants. Okay, so that's consistent with our hypothesis. This is another one that it's a little uh, I'll have to go slow. What we did here is plot the number of times in, on, uh, uh, we have about 200 different studies, where the seasonal minimum as a percent of the maximum uh, varied from zero to 100. So zero means the minimum goes to zero of the maximum. They use it all. So this end is they use it all. Minimum 100, they don't use Okay? And so this is again for the different organs, leaves, roots, and stems, and then the soluble sugars, the starch, and the total non-structural carbohydrates is the same as non-structural carbohydrates. So what we see here is that, let's start with, um, <laughs> to simplify, let's focus on this. The soluble sugars, most of the time, the soluble sugars, for most of the studies, don't go below 36, okay? Um, <clears throat> in contrast, so here remember, close to zero is when they use it, close to 100 is when they don't use it. So a lot of the solid sugars are not used. In contrast, the starch most of the time is used. The starch is really the storage uh, uh, part, so they do use the starch, but not the soluble sugars. Those are the ones that maybe uh, uh, function as a smotic. And as a result of the soluble sugars, we see that the totals are overwhelmingly uh, above 40%. So that really what this suggests is that these minimums are overwhelmingly very high, that this is because of the soluble sugars, that they need to be high, and the idea is they need to be high to retain the water. And in contrast, the starch Depletion is very common. The starch is really the one that, that buffers, but not the soluble sugars, okay? So the summary so far, plants maintain high and constant seasonal uh, minimums due to high soluble sugars. This is consistent with that osmotic role of storage. Non-structural carbohydrates and soluble sugar depletion is very rare. We don't see it in, in, in nature. So that again suggests that these are uh, non-structural carbohydrates are there for a reason, for perhaps this osmotic <coughs> reason. But starch depletion is common. So that's the classical re uh, reserve function. So this suggests that storage is likely much more than storage, you okay? guys, more than a reservoir. It also has this important uh, osmotic function. Okay. <coughs> so again, to the a century old um, idea that plants trade water for carbon, the trade off between water acquisition and carbon assimilation, we now add a new idea that plants might actually need to retain or keep carbon this in, as in the form of non-structural carbohydrates to retain and move water. So it goes both ways. Yes, they do trade water to get CO2, but they also need to keep these non-structural carbohydrates high to retain and move the water, okay? So um, what's the data? So, so far our review is consistent, doesn't show anything. It just shows that yes, they, 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 these minimums are high, this is consistent with our hypothesis, but now we need the the evidence that these NSCs are involved in water relations. And <clears throat> this is a study that is not ours and that the authors didn't pay any attention to a pattern that I found was very interesting. So they did an irrigation experiment with um, Pinus, um, uh, the, the uh, Pinus uh, 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 juvies. So 
what's the, the, na the common name? In the southwest, they'll find that the person is the junior person, okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay? So they did a drought experiment. There's been a lot of mortality there, and they measured the uh, water potential over time in irrigated pines, the stars, in pines that were subjected to drought, the <coughs> white symbols, and then they put some pines in the dark, which they kept irrigating, okay? And so, and then they measured each one of them until they died, the, the drought, okay? And this is when the dark pines died, okay, right here. But what we see is that before they died, their water status declined despite the fact that they were irrigated. And what they measure is that, uh, what they saw also is because they are putting them in the dark, they are not photosynthesizing, they are consuming the reserves for energy respiration. So they are becoming depleted, and as they are becoming depleted, their water status is declining. So that, to me, was very important, and it's interesting you see patterns in papers that the authors don't highlight, but to me that was very important. This other study was published in Nature Climate Change. It was also very uh, uh, revealing to me. They experimentally, this is tropical seedlings, and they experimentally manipulated the, the non-structural carbohydrate <coughs> storage, and then they subjected them to drought and measured how long it took them to die. And what they saw is that systematically, the plants that were depleted died early than the plants that were enriched. It was very little difference, just nine days, but for a seedling, nine days is life or death in the tropics, okay? <coughs> okay. So that, our own uh, results, this is a very bright undergraduate student that did a fantastic project. She subjected these ponderosa pines in complete dark, and this is how they looked. One day we removed them from the dark, they were completely flaccid, okay? And so what she saw is that, as expected, um, these are the controls, no dark, and this is one, two, up to six weeks of dark. The total non-structural carbohydrates declines. We expect that. They are not photosynthesizing, yet they are responding, <coughs> using them for energy. There is a depletion. But what was interesting, so these pines were irrigated all the time. The water status of the no dark controls was high, but the dark plants, the water potential kept decreasing. They kept getting more and more water stress. Okay, despite the fact that they were irrigated. So we're removing the carbohydrates, and then they are not able to retain water in their water, and they dry up, okay? So this is what we found, a, a, a nice relationship between the non-structural carbohydrate, <coughs> non carbohydrate store and the water status, so the lower, the drier. As the plants are subjected to one to three weeks of dark, their water potential keeps declining. Four, five, six weeks of dark keeps declining further. This is a mystery. When I ever show this graph to people, say, these plants are irrigated. How in the world does their water status go down? And I suspect it's because plants are losing water all the time. And I suspect this is because they don't have enough soluble sugars, not enough uh, non-structural carbohydrates to really retain that water. And because they are losing, they are getting dry, even though we are watering them. So this suggests that these non-structural carbohydrates are critical for water relations of plants, okay? And this is a work with um, a graduate student of mine, Gerard Sepes, with a project that we actually have in common with Solomon Dabrowski. And um, he also subjected some of these ponderosa pine seedlings to dark, he calls shade, but it was dark. We know that that depletes the non-structural carbohydrates. And what he found is that the plants that were in the shade, their osmotic water potential, so this is equivalent to the ability to lower their water potential, to that, to the value of the of the of the xylem. So the ability to accumulate solutes is m lower in the, in the plants that are in the shade. The plants that are in the sun, 
they accumulate solutes because they have high NSC, and the solute accumulation allows them to lower their water potential to uh, values close on this island. So what you want in a living cell is the ability to lower the water potential while retaining water, okay? So is, does that make sense? Yeah? yeah? So something that people, my students have a hard time, salt water is wet. It's physiologically extremely dry because it has a lot of solids. So even though it's wet, uh, uh, it's, it's physiologically very dry because it has solutes and that lowers the water potential and that makes it hard for plants to get water out of it. So these plants that have are in the light, they are able to accumulate <coughs> solutes and they are able to make themselves physiologically dry, therefore getting water from the xylem while still being wet, okay? <coughs> And so we did another experiment that was with collaborators in Spain with, um, this is Scott's pine, that we also have oaks, but the results I'm gonna show you is for a Scotch pine. So we subjected them to uh, drought after a year of acclimation in the greenhouse. And then we measure a bunch of variables and their effect on survival under drought. So values above zero, increased survival, this given variable increases survival, Below zero, this given variable <coughs> decreases survival. And I'm just gonna highlight a couple of those. Which variables increase survival? Well, one are variables related to photosynthesis. The photosynthesis brings carbohydrates, okay? Now, to bring carbohydrates, that means that stomata need to be open, and therefore I'm losing water, okay? so. Survival was greater in plants that keep their stomata open. These are plants that are under drought, and you think they're gonna close the stomata. That's gonna be the first survival strategy, prevent water loss. Well, no. The ones that were using more water were the ones that were photosynthesizing more, and those are the ones that survived longer, okay? And the other <coughs> was soluble sugar. <coughs> plants that had higher soluble sugars, they survived longer. <coughs> So we, that was difficult for us because <coughs> at the beginning of our thinking is how, what are these plants doing? They are in the drought, extreme drought, and they are opening stomata and losing water. It makes no sense. Why are they doing that? Now, we suspect that it is because they were, their storage was so critically low that if it gets to below certain thresholds, they'll die. And if it rains after that, they're gonna be dead because they're gonna be losing dirt. So what these plants are doing, what their storage pools become very low, that's the interpretation that we're giving, they are prioritizing carbon assimilation, even if that entails water loss. Why? Because in nature it can rain, particularly in Mediterranean systems. After the summer, it rains. So the, the, the evolutionary strategy is, is coupled with the seasonal patterns of precipitation. So it's a strategy, these plants are risking water banking that it's gonna rain later because otherwise they're gonna die, okay? So we, we interpret that these plants were doing this weird thing because they really were prioritizing storage because if this storage goes down, then there's no recovery possible even if it rains after that. So, <coughs> We then, ooh, that's not good. <laughs> um, I forgot to do that, sorry. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, yes. so, so then the idea is that um, we feel that this storage it's, it's this classical role, the reservoir, but also it has this very important metabolic uh, function. And so to the water for carbon trade-off, we also add carbon for water. And so that the regulation of non-structural carbohydrate storage might be, or we now, I think now I'm at the point where I can say is critical for water relations and responses to drought. So the issue is why do we care? Well, 
We care because many, many reasons, and I'm gonna highlight a few of them, you know, how plants are gonna respond to drought. We, we, I think we all agree that we care about, right? Climate change is gonna bring drought. There is, it's, it's <coughs> you know, the, the water relations is a field that is one of the oldest fields in plant physiology. We need to water plants for them to grow, right? And it's the field of plant hydraulics is plagued with, with controversy of all sorts. And for many different reasons. But perhaps one of the many reasons is because we're actually missing a big com a component, which is this role of these non-structural carbohydrates. And that has been highlighted. We also talk about uh, stomatal regulation, amount of roots, amount of leaves. Well, maybe we need to think about these uh, non-structural carbohydrates. The other reason is because we have a big, big problem that the public is not realizing, but there has been a substantial increase in drought-induced mortality all over the world, not only in dry places, but in the tropics, everywhere. We've seen an increase in drought-induced mortality in forests. That's a big deal. It's a big deal because forests store 45% uh, of uh, uh, or contribute 45% of um, carbon uh, uh, accumulation in, in <coughs> on Earth, store a lot of carbon. There's a lot of carbon stored, and that carbon that is in the trees is not in the atmosphere. So if they die, they're gonna decompose and the carbon is gonna go back to the atmosphere. <coughs> Increased carbon CO2 then could lead to increased temperatures and we have this vegetation climate feedback. So it's a big deal, this mortality. And we are in scratching our head for about 10 years now, how to predict, how to predict that mortality. We need to know which forests are more susceptible. Do we need to go and start thinning? What do we need to do? There's another <coughs> important issue. There's a lot of people in it, that depend on forests for basic heating and fuel. So it, there is a social component to that, not only ecological, okay? So modelers have been trying to model, okay, how much carbon will the land uh, uh, be able to hold, okay? I'm simplifying here, but over time, given climate change. And what we see is that these models do a terribly poor job. Each, this, each line is a different model. Go figure where right? the truth is, right? So we re and, and, and we've identified that the main problem of these models is that we don't know how to predict mortality with climate change. Something as simple, I tell my mom, what my mom asked me, what do you study? And I say, why plants die under drought? And she looks at me, she's a very intelligent woman, and looks at me, so well, don't they die because they don't have water? <laughs> and I say, yes. But such a simple question, you see, we don't know to model when little is little enough for them to die, okay? So we, a, a very, a, an important component, we might be missing an important component, which is very much related to the carbon dynamics in plants which is these non-structural carbohydrates. And that might act, could actually help a little, not resolve it completely, but help a little. And so <coughs> this is my uh, results from my graduate student that show what my mom anticipated, that plants die when they don't have water, right? <laughs> and, <coughs> and so th we measured, we did that. We, uh, Gerard, my graduate student, did an experiment where he, he measured the water content of plants and then the probability of mortality and just focus on this on this line here which is for the whole plant so what we see this means that the plant is under drought is starting to lose water but then there is a point where bang mortality goes up so that means that these plants are reaching the point of turgor loss point they, uh, they, they cannot survive. If they lose turgor, if that water is not under positive pressure in living cells, and then <coughs> is when mortality skyrockets. This is very good news for modeling. Because now we know the variable that we can focus on, the water content. And we also know that this water content depends on carbohydrates. And so, um, <coughs> which is 
Uh, this is the, the same graph. We, uh, <coughs> we see this is the water content. This is um, the hydraulic supply, so how much water is moving up, okay? Actually, this is the loss of hydraulic supply as, as plants are under drought. So the more they lose supply, the water content decreases. That makes sense. But then we have a positive relationship with carbohydrates and the different lines are different organs of the plants. The more starch we have, the higher the capacity to retain a lot. Okay. So, <coughs> so the, the conclusion is that this abundant storage of uh, non-structural carbohydrates is not excess. We are now pretty certain that it's not excess, that they have this critical function to retain and move water. And this might actually be uh, a sort of a big step forward to start uh, modeling and predicting uh, mortality and understanding better water relations. And with this, I'll finish. Thank you very much. Great, plenty of time for questions for Dr. Sala, please. <laughs> this, this issue of non-sequestered NSC, it, 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 um, it seems like if it were sequestered, you'd have a much harder problem for measuring because you'd have to where in the location of the plant would become critical versus now you can do a bulk measurement to get NSC. Um, and then you cite the evidence of these old uh, stumps that grow in 15-year-old carbon. How, how universal is this non-sequestration? How much do you believe? So this, uh, this work has been done um, using the carbon-14 spike during the uh, nuclear testing. So we had a spike of carbon-14, and then plants are assimilating it. And so then we can age. How old is that carbon? Um, we are, you know, the, the, the testing was in the 50s. We are 2017, so it's been a long time. So there's a certain degree of uncertainty in this precise age, but there's been repeated studies showing that uh, that plants can tap into 10, 12, 15 year old carbon store. So I'm pretty, uh, some starch do, starch is, starch is, in, is, is actually beautiful molecule, nasty molecule, both because it's extremely complex and sometimes those granules are really hard to, 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 to get into. So it, the store is, it starts is, is, is glucose branch and form change, but then there's lots of branching. And it stores like, with, like an onion, you know, layers of uh, added glucose. And sometimes it's very difficult for enzymes to get into the center of the granule. So you're actually hitting to a very important point, which is the measurement of of starch, you would believe that in the 21st century you would figure how to measure starch, right? Wrong. It's extremely hard. And we did a study comparing uh, results from um, uh, uh, including 40 laboratories around the world, the same exact samples, but widely different results. We were all listening. The only saving grace is that within a given lab, they were consistent. So, but the absolute number, we still don't know. So, so getting at the start that is really available, really accessible, it's, it continues to be a, a very hard question. So with these labeling studies, we're pretty certain they can do use all carbon, but there is a lot, you're, you're right, there's a lot of unknown and a lot more. I, I think actually, when I grew up, as a, when I was a student, <coughs> You know, we used to do a lot of staining and, and whatnot. We are going back to the area of visual, uh, of visualization, which is much more sophisticated techniques. And I think now we need to couple that visualization with genomics to say, okay, what, what enzymes are going up and down? How do we see these, this, where do we see these compounds? Where do they go? Does this match what we're doing or what we're thinking? Did I respond? Oh, yeah. I have, a, I have another follow on if I could dominate for a second. Um, but so let's take okay, question. I'll come back. <laughs> you, you can ask your other question. I was just going to ask, uh, you know, is there any kind of studies like too much water? Is there, you know, plants, if they get too much water, Absolutely. what happens? Absolutely. So plowing is another big stress for plants. And um, 
plans that are not adapted to flood, uh, flooding, for instance, rushes and, 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 and plants from marshy places, even mangroves. Um, the big problem with flooding is that there is not enough diffusion of oxygen to the roots, so they cannot respire and erupt, right? So, depending on the type of plant, for instance, Douglas fir is extremely sensitive to flooding. You've uh, beaver dam and, and, and lodge pole, if you've hiked around and you'll see dams, you'll see a lot of dead trees is because of flooding. So flooding can be a big deal and for some crops, so there's been a lot of research for too much water. And that relates to lack of, of diffusion of oxygen and the roots cannot reach fire. Adapted plants have tissues with a lot of intercellular spaces that make a connection that allow the diffusion of air from above the atmosphere to, to, to down below. And the mangroves, if you've been in, in Florida, which I have not, but they have these, these, these things that stick out of the water, that's to get oxygen and bring it back. So there's been decades of work looking at plant hydraulics in the context of looking at xylem water potential, and you hinted at this. Um, are, would you suggest, given this body of work, that we should be shifting towards measuring osmotic potential and volumetric water content <coughs> as the variable, key variables of interest, as opposed to xylem water potential? So Solomon, thank you, thank you for <laughs> bobbing that. <laughs> thank you for making me highlight something very important. So the issue of drought in deep mortality. I think since 90, uh, 2008 to now, which is less than 10 years, it has resulted in about 500 papers. A lot, a lot of research. And it's very interesting. So this is actually for you students and, and me and my students. Um, in the 50s, plant physiologists, how they measure water status is just by weighing tissue, drying it, and then seeing how much water there was. That was a water condom, okay? Well, that was a little bit of a pain because it, it, it I mean, actually it's not a pain, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we came up with the pressure bomb, which is this other instrument that allows us to measure the water potential. And, and actually, if you've not seen it, it's a really cool little thing. You put, you, you cut, you, so the, you have the plan, you cut the, the xylem is under tension, right? So when you cut it, that tension zoom, goes through the receipts. And then you get the, the, the cut and you stick it in a chamber and then you pressurize, pressurize, pressurize until you see that water coming up. Mm -hmm. That pressure is equivalent to the tension. So that's a pressure bomb and we call it bomb because it's a bomb, because um, <laughs> it's, it's bad. I mean, it, it can it, a shoot if you don't have it well sealed, can go and, and perforate <laughs> the ceiling. So you have to be very careful. And um, so the pressure bomb be became the gold standard to measure water potential, right? Because it, it was very easy. You can bring it to the field. You can measure stems. It was very easy. And so we all kind of forgot about the water content. And so uh, plant physiologists were focusing on models to model that xylem tension, thinking that that's the key variable. A and the reason is because when you are under drought and the tension increases, 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 what happens is that the tension might be excessive and the liquid water column breaks. Yeah. If that happens, that's called cavitation. If that happens, that's bad news because you, you have a bubble of air and you interrupt. So plant physiologists have been focusing on modeling that and we've really not gotten much of anywhere. And our results suggest that, hey, we should be focusing on how much water there is in living cells. And that is indeed a function of how much water is, is moving through the xylem, so we still care about the xylem, but also how much water they can retain given the amount of solids they have. So, so our results, are, it, it, this is, just brand new, but we hope to send it for publication very soon because I think there's the sort of the first result that showed this is very clear threshold response. So plants are fine until to a point, and that point coincides when they lose dirt. That is when mortality comes up. So that water content, and and the cool thing is that we can measure in remote sensing, so we can have we can you know satellites can monitor, and you can monitor water content. You can tell, whoa, this one is getting close. Let's do one. 
Let's take one more question and then all the landowner ever wants to get out of the cell. a pretty simple question. And that is in deciduous plants with all that carbon in their leaves, are they grabbing it out before they drop their leaves in the fall or whatever time of year they drop them? This is a very interesting question. So the they grab the nitrogen, they grab the phosphorus. Do they grab the, the non-structural carbohydrates? You know what? I don't know. Is it cheap enough to make it they can afford to drop it? It might be cheap enough to make it because they make it in the spring when there is plenty of water and the risk is. But I, actually, you know, I don't know. Maybe after this, I'm going to go in the car and think, what was I thinking? Of course they do, but right now I don't think they do. <laughs> All right, well, that was great, uh, Dr. Sala. And um, I know everyone wants to get out in the field. Uh, but we want to thank you again for your thank wonderful you. talk and for coming up to the Bio Station to visit us. Yeah.